Mine is a co-founder and board member of the Coalition for Safe Minds and a founding board member of the National Autism Association and is published in a number of journals. She's appeared in Good Morning America, uh, Mothering Magazine. She's the mother of three and a terrific person. Uh, please welcome Lynn Redwood. I thank you. What Scott forgot to mention is that my youngest son, Will, who's 19, was diagnosed with progressive autism. And what I wanted to talk to you about today was a little bit of the history of the federal response to autism. Um, the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, which is a committee that I've served on since 2006, was originally created by the Children's Health Act of 2000. This committee was mandated to create a 10-year plan for autism research. Congress also stipulated that the plan should be revised and expanded as current goals are achieved and new goals are identified. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll just keep going. The slides are not that important. Um, in 2000, NIH brought together an expert panel that was tasked with reviewing the state of autism research based on the NIH autism research matrix. With regard to environmental research, all of the experts agreed that the role of the environment in autism, broadly defined to include an array of non-genetic risk factors, was given insufficient attention in the first development of the autism research matrix. So then in 2006, we had the new Combating Autism Act. And this act was intended to rapidly accelerate the pace and improve coordination of scientific discovery in autism research. The Combating Autism Act requires the IACC to again develop a strategic plan and to update it annually, but also to include proposed budgetary requirements. So that was something new. The new IACC was appointed and a new strategic plan was created, but the unfortunate thing is that there was minimal effort to incorporate the previous recommendations regarding the need for an increased focus on environmental research. So I wanted to share with you what we have done in the last, oh, over a decade now with regard to federal spending. I'm sorry the slide doesn't show up a little better, but you can see over the years this nice increase in spending, uh, which comes up to a total of one billion one hundred and twenty-two million, I think, from what I can see from here. And this is derived from a combination of GAO reports and the congressional reports uh, on autism. Now what I want to drill into now, and this gets to the issues that Dick and Erga were both talking about, is research spending by category. Um, question three of the strategic plan, and all this information is available online at the IACC website. It's www.iacc.hhs.gov. And I want to also say that uh, a, lot of, a lot of what I will also share are my personal opinions, and that I am not representing the committee in any way. I am a public member on that committee. So question three drills into the question of what caused this to happen and can it be prevented? And this is where we see most of the genetic and environmental research in this whole plan reflected. You can see from this chart, well, I hope you can see from this chart, that a majority of the spending is on purely genetic research. That's that large sort of dark orange portion of the chart. And the little small sliver over there, there's epigenetics research and gene environment research combined together. So you can see there's just a very modest investment in epigenetic research and also purely environmental factors, like what Urkel was talking about. So what have we really learned from genetics research? The plethora of autism risk genes that we've identified only account for a fraction of clinically diagnosed cases. The high prevalence of de novo mutations, and these are genetic abnormalities that are new. They were not found in the mother or the father. Support a large environmental component to autism spectrum disorders. Genetic research so far has been focused on finding the genetic mutation versus looking how the environment might impact the normal genome in a susceptible infant. And that focus has yielded very few insights into autism. As Dick and Irva both said, identifying these environmental modifiers of autism risk represent the only strategy for mitigating risk for children. 
So it's critical that we shift focus from a purely genetic research to a heightened focus on environmental factors. And with limited resources, we must be strategic and accountable for our research investments. So I wanted to also point out, I pulled from our strategic plan two sort of representative uh, objectives that deal both with genetic research and environmental research. The first one up there, Project 3LB, is to identify genetic risk in at least 50% of people with autism spectrum disorders by 2014. And the recommended budget that we had for this for over six years was $33 million. The next one that I have there is Project 3LC, and that's to determine the effects of at least five environmental factors on the risk for subtypes of ASD in the early prenatal and postnatal period. The recommended budget for this was over 25 million over seven years. So if you look at the next slide, I broke down what's actually been spent, and this is all of the objectives are listed across the bottom of, uh, of the slide here. And you can see the one that Eric has the cursor on, uh, go back here. That's the genetic funding. And what I want to point out about the genetic funding is that for each year that I have data available, which is 2008, 9, and 10, our budget total was 33 million. We spent the first year, 2008, 37 million, the second year, 49 million, and the third year, 34 million. So we exceeded our total budget over six years in the first three years of the study. We have made a total investment of $121 million in genetics research. Now when you look at the environmental component that I mentioned, we're falling far under budget. The total amount that we have invested is only five, almost six million dollars, and we are not on track to accomplish that objective. So it's obvious that NIH is not following its own advisory committee's strategic plan recommendations. The other thing I wanted to put out is that the IACC has yet to look at cumulative funding on these objectives or to actually evaluate their success. I'm hoping that that's something that this next year the IACC will start working on. So why some of this disparity? As Dick mentioned, the initial thinking was that autism was purely a genetic disorder. So it seemed like a reasonable place to start, especially with the Human Genome Project underway. But today we know that there are as many as 400 genes involved in autism risk and that many of the genetic findings are pointing to environmental factors. Based on a study that Dick mentioned, the Hallmeyer Twin Study, which is the largest study to date on twins, they were able to apply mathematical modeling to the study and determine that approximately 55% of the risk for autism was related to environmental factors, and only 37% was related to genetics. So progress to be able to look at these environmental factors are going to require a more integrated approach with transdisciplinary studies focused on clinically relevant exposures that we can change. But unfortunately, some environmental factors, like vaccines, are discouraged from investigation, which was not the intent of Congress when they said that no stone should be left unturned when investigating autism. So I wanted to give a sort of an example of this. In 2009, the IACC voted to reverse a previously approved decision to include objectives relating to vaccine safety research as part of its deliberations for the strategic plan. And what I have up here is a press release that was put out by Autism Speaks where they pulled their support for the strategic plan for autism research based on this move to remove funding for vaccine research. One of the reasons it was given for this was the plethora of autism cases pending in the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. I want to point out that vaccine exposure is an environmental exposure. It's one of the things that our infants are first exposed to. And they're now exposed to vaccines during pregnancy as well with flu vaccines. And one of the things that Irva mentioned was the immune response from infection that can occur that we know can be linked to autism. There's also an immune response from vaccination, and that's something that we're not looking at at all. There was a report that was released in 2011, and it was published in the Pace Environmental Law Review. This is the publication that I have up here. And this review was based on verifiable government data, which found a substantial number of children compensated for vaccine injury who were also diagnosed with autism after vaccine-averse events, such as fevers, um, seizures, 
And this data has been in existence since 1989. That was the year that the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program was first formed. They were able to find, I think they looked at 1,300 cases and 80 cases of those actually mentioned autism and they went and went through all the case data. So this is something that we know exists. We know that vaccines can cause autism, but now we have to look to see how many cases have been caused by vaccines. And the more important question is, how can we make vaccines safer for all children? It's, it's not, you know, we, we work so hard to control infectious disease and we've been very successful with the vaccine program, but we also need to work on controlling some of the adverse effects from vaccines. So um, this is an issue that we will drill into more deeply with our next congressional briefing. So if this is a topic that you're interested in, uh, we will send out notifications again. But as, as Eric mentioned, autism, April is Autism Awareness Month. So we're asking that Congress now move from awareness to action and accountability. So some of the things that Congress can do is to get serious about environmental factors research. We need appropriation language for specific environmental research objectives. I know Congress doesn't like to dictate to NIH what to study, but I think at this point in time, they need to step in and, and provide language and direction for the NIH. Uh, NIH needs to create targeted requests for proposals and requests for applications and set aside funding for environmental related research to fill these gaps. They also need to be utilizing, you can utilize other federal agencies such as EPA that has expertise in environmental exposures and the Department of Defense that utilizes a unique model of research that engages the stakeholder community in actually funding research. A lot of people are not aware that this program exists, but it's a wonderful model. You can also get involved by conducting hearings on autism and environmental factors. You can use the Oversight, Energy and Commerce, Appropriations Committee, and I ask that you please engage the parent and advocates and families on the development of any legislation and reach out to a broad swath of, of the autism community because no one group speaks for the entire community. The other things that Congress can do is to provide accountability and, and oversight. The Combating Autism Act is up for reauthorization in 2014. Mandate annual accountability of research objectives and progress for research goals. We also could desperately use a White House level coordination of all ASD activities. This is something that the IACC is tasked with doing, but the harsh reality is this committee is formed by uh, heads of institutes and a handful of advocates. We meet maybe four times a year, and we're a part-time committee. We don't have any authority to set policy or to fund research, and we have inadequate staff to, re re to respond to these ever-growing needs. So we really need more coordination. You could create an Office of ASD Research, and this would be modeled after the Office of AIDS Research. Presently, the National Institute of Mental Health is the lead agency responsible for autism research. But as Irva mentioned, we have learned that autism is not a mental health disorder. It is a whole body disorder. You can also hold hearings on vaccine safety. We desperately need research to better understand why some infants are harmed by vaccines and others are not. Compensation of families of injured, injured children isn't enough. We need to prevent the injuries and we need to know what can be done to keep these from occurring in the future. We also, and this is my final request, we need our federal agencies and the CDC to respond to the epidemic of autism with the same urgency, resources, and coordinated efforts as they would do with a threat of pandemic flu or an E. coli outbreak. We're in a crisis situation now. The last numbers that just came out that were mentioned, it was one in 50 children. Because boys are affected four to one to girls, that's one in every 31 boys in our country that are of school age. And this is a crisis, and we have to deal with this now.